Totalitarian groups want one and one thing only, complete and total control. And they achieve this by isolation, by isolating the individual, by isolating people from being able to trust one another in relationships, from isolating the individual from their own thoughts, from information, from knowledge, all for their nefarious gains and means to establish their utopian society. Welcome to the Lucas Scrobot Show, where we uncover purpose, relentlessly pursue truth, and own the future. I am your host, Lucas Scrobot, and I thank you for joining me on this episode of the show. We are in a series on totalitarian states, totalitarian cults, totalitarian groups. In fact, the size of the group doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it is five people or five million people, but but totalitarian ideologies can exist and puts every person in danger in those groups and even outside of those groups. Totalitarian ideologies are toxic, are dangerous, and we need to be aware of them even if we think, well, I don't live in a totalitarian state. I don't, I'm not a part of a totalitarian cult. I'm not part of a totalitarian um, group or organization. But if we are not aware of the principles, we're not aware of the, the ideologies that surround us and are around us, we can fall prey to them. And that is what we talk about right here on the show about knowing truth uncovering truth, being people that don't just know it, but people that walk in truth. We need to be people that walk in the truth, walk in the light, walk in knowing who we are as people so that we can go out and, that's right, own the future. Just as we talk about, we need to watch our thoughts because our thoughts produce our feelings, which produce our actions, which then produce our thoughts. We need to be aware of the schemes that are out there in the world that are destructive. Totalitarian ideologies are destructive. People coming out of totalitarian organizations or cults or groups or states often have years of post-traumatic stress disorder, often have years of health issues, mental issues. These are, are real problems, real problems that are affecting people and we need to be aware of it. Uh, Solomon Ash, we've talked about him on the previous episode. Solomon Ash was a psychologist, social psychologist in the 1950s. In 1952, he wrote, quote, the greater, the greater man's ignorance of the principles of his surroundings, of his social surroundings, the more subject He is to their control and the greater his knowledge of their operation and of their necessary consequences, the freer he can be with regards to them. The more ignorant we are of the principles of our surroundings, the more subject we will be to their control. And I'm seeing this right now across social media, across my friend groups, I am seeing people falling subject to these totalitarian ideologies without even knowing it. They're playing into the tactics, the fear tactics, the shame tactics, the humiliation tactics of totalitarian cult-like groups, and they don't even know it. But if we have knowledge of the operations of these totalitarian groups and the consequences, because it's not just knowing how they work, but realizing, wait, this bears really bad fruit. These have really negative consequences. If we're aware of that, then we can defend ourselves against that. And we can be freer from them. We don't need to bow and bend our knee to these destructive ideologies. So we also talked about in the previous episode, the story of of Havel's story of the green grocer and how we must stand for truth. How just because everyone else is putting the banner in their window of their store out of fear, out of fear of consequences, out of realizing if we don't, if he doesn't, he's not going to have the opportunities that 
society will give him. He will be ostracized. He will be humiliated. He might be killed. But when we stand up for truth, when we stand up and say, no, this is what I think, when we stand up for free thinking, when we stand up to have ideas of our own, we break the spell for others around us. And that is how we can own the future. That is how we can own the future, by breaking the spell for those around us, by standing for truth, standing what we, for what we believe in. These are crucial. So today we're going to talk about six, that's right, six different modes of operation of totalitarian ideologies. Now, this is not a end-all, be-all list. For sure, there is more and, you know, more than just this that exists in totalitarian groups, totalitarian cults or states, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I want you to notice that some of these ideas that we're going to talk about actually also exist in non-totalitarian groups in healthy ways. For instance, uh, punishments and rewards. Most all groups, most all societies have a system of punishments and rewards. If you break the rules, if you break the law, you're going to go to jail. There are consequences for our actions. But if we are a valuable part of society and we're helping people, if we're, we're, we have a business that is actually serving people's needs, we're going to be rewarded with not only with finances, but with honor. So Another aspect that we're going to see when we look at these six is that is that some of these some most all totalitarian groups believe that they are the only force of good in the world and everyone else is evil. They believe that they are the the only force of of moral superiority and everyone else is evil. But we see that. In, in a lot of groups, in a lot of world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all believe that there is, theirs is the only way and all other ways are wrong. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these religions are totalitarian because there's more than just one of these that have to take place. There are, are more of these fear manipulation brainwashing tactics that are also coming into play Um um, humiliating, uh, excommunicating. The, there's more that goes into play than just one or two of these things. It's the unhealthy expression that's used often for nefarious or criminal gains. And that's that's one of the, the biggest points that we need to remember, that totalitarian groups, at the core of, of their ideology is deception. They say one thing on the outside, to the outside world, they have two different narratives. They have one thing to the outside world, and they have another narrative in to the inside world. And often, the the adherents or the members of these groups are not aware of the criminal and nefarious uh, goals and and ideas and end games of these totalitarian cults. They're often not aware of where these totalitarian movements are trying to take society at large. Totalitarian ideologies want complete and total control. So when we look at these major world religions, not all of them want complete and total control over every single aspect of the individual's life. So as we go through this list, we got to make sure not to conflate two things. We can't say, oh, well, there's this aspect here that seems to appear in this other organization, so we're going to conflate it and say that is totalitarian. No, it's not. We need to be we need to be clear in our definition. So, as I mentioned before, there's a difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism, or an authoritarian authoritarian and a totalitarian government or group. An authoritarian says, you know what? I don't care if you disagree with me. I don't care if you have your own thought. I don't care if you believe whatever you believe, but you got to obey the rule of law. You have to obey me. I am the strong man. No matter what, you have to obey me. You can disagree with me, but you got to obey me. Totalitarianism is very different in that it's not just that you got to agree with me, but is also that you have, well, it's not that you just have to obey me, but it is that you have to be fully bought in to the ideology of the group, and you cannot have a thought outside of the talking points of the group. So that's another important distinction to make between authoritarianism and 
totalitarianism. So what are the six conditions of totalitarian groups or cults? So Margaret Singer in her book, Cults in Our Midst from 1996. Now, this is not Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was the eugenics uh, member of the, the Nazi party from Germany. She came from Germany to America with strong affiliations with the KKK. She believed in the Aryan race, and she was the one that set up Planned Parenthood with the expressed idea and ideology of getting rid of black and minority people across the world through killing babies in the womb. That's right, abortion. So we're not, this is not Margaret Sanger, who's responsible for the death of tens of millions of babies, but this is Margaret Singer. So Margaret writes this, that there are six conditions, six descriptions of totalitarian groups or cults. And, and the first condition is they want to control the environment. They want absolute control over the environment. The second one is a system of rewards and punishments. Now notice there's, you know, Parents have a system of rewards and punishments for their kids. It's every company have a system of rewards and punishments for their employees. You sell more product, you get a higher commission, right? That's a reward and a punishment. You don't sell, you get fired. But that doesn't mean that company is totalitarianism, okay? Number, th number three, creating a sense of powerlessness. Number four, fear and dependency. This is the biggest one. And we can see this also in, in toxic codependent relationships, abusive relationships. We see this uh, with, cult, with, with, with pimps and their prostitutes, with human trafficking. They create this fear and dependency. So even in those, we can see there's totalitarian ideologies that are existing in, in these prostitution, prostitution rings. Fear and dependency. Number five, Reforming the followers' behavior and attitudes. Number six, it's all within a closed system of logic. What that means is nothing else can enter in. It's this, it's this cyclical argument that cannot, that no other information can be introduced be, besides the ideology itself. And it's so cyclical. But anytime that it allows any other information to be introduced. It breaks that cycle. And that is why there needs to be, number one, complete and total control. So let's look at these six different conditions of totalitarian groups. So number one, the controlling of the environment. So the, the often the first way that these groups control the environment is they have a self-appointed sovereign leadership a self-appointed sovereign leadership. It's not, they're not voted in by the people. There is one person who controls everything. So oftentimes in these totalitarian or, you know, socialism is, is a totalitarian state. Um, they have these fake elections where, you know, Stalin would have these fake elections. Like he's getting elected time and time and time again, but they all know that these are elections are just, fake. They're just a, a show. There's only one way to vote. The other way, if you vote the other way, you're going to end up dead. Um, another thing Stalin would do anytime there seemed to be cliques or groups of leadership forming underneath him, he would demote and promote other people. He would consistently make sure that he was the only one that had power within the group. There's the, with that, there's the appearance of free will. These, these groups, these ideologies, they prey on people's um, good notions and their decency to begin with. They use words like equality. They use words like freedom, love, peace, um, uh, uh, unity, diversity. They use these, these words of um, equality, justice, and they prey on that. And then they set up these, again, almost like false elections. There's only one way to vote. There's only one thing that you can decide. And they, they're controlling it. But they give people this appearance of free will. Like, well, you want this, right? So, of course, you'll vote in this. And as I said before, deception. 
across the board. Everything that they do is deception. They have one agenda on the outside to their adherence, but on the inside, the real core objective is different. Uh, another point in the controlling of the environment, they have their structure is hard to pinpoint. It's hard to, when you try to follow the money in these organization, organizations, it could be uh, corporate organizations, it could be clubs, it could be religious cults. Um, when you try to follow the money or you try to look at, well, what is the structure? Who Who is the leader accountable to? The leader is accountable to no one. They, are, they consider themselves above the law. They consider this, themselves above any sort of moral code. They have some superior knowledge and the the organization underneath them is very convoluted and it's kept that way so that it causes confusion. Again, they control the environment by monopolizing information. They control all the information, everything that comes in and out. They control your relationships. They control who you can be friends with, who you can't be friends with. Once you become indoctrinated into these groups, they say, hey, if your family members don't subscribe to our ideologies as well and don't join as well, you need to cut them off. You can't talk to them because their ideas are going to corrupt you. Their ideas are going to corrupt your, your ability for redemption. And so they, they isolate. The first thing they do is isolate the individual from their normal relationships so that they can control all the information that comes to them and that, that's where censorship and cancel culture and everything comes in. They believe, these totalitarian cults and groups believe that they are enlightened. They believe that they are have the, the moral high ground. And so anything that comes from outside, they will label as unenlightened or negative or impure or absolute evil. They say that all free-thinking individuals – and all quantifiable evidence that challenges their narrative and challenges their authority is corrupted, is a lie, is evil. And I've I've seen this so often. I've been in conversations with people recently where I will pull out certain statistics, quantifiable, empirical evidence. And it's like, oh, well, you know, that evidence is just corrupted. You can just play with the numbers and get it to say whatever you want to say. So they they dismiss totalitarian groups and dismiss quantifiable evidence. They dismiss the facts because the facts will totally undermine, the truth will totally undermine their narrative and their agenda. As I said before, they want total control and they steadfastly pretend that they have the moral and intellectual authority. They say, you know what? We are the enlightened ones. We have the moral authority. We are the only force of good in the earth. We are the ones that are going to bring about this new utopia, this new change. And everything on the outside is big, bad, and evil. And because we are good and because they are bad, we can justify all of our action and all of our criminal Action is hidden under this veil of we are good. And because of that, they can justify to their adherence, to their members, and manipulate their members to, to commit crimes for the sake of the group. And the people are going along with it thinking that they are waging this war of social justice to bring forth you know, a, a new age to the earth. It's, it's, it's horrible. With this controlling of the environment, destructive leaders, these leaders, they hold themselves accountable to no one and they rewrite history. And we're going to talk about this in the coming episodes, even about the, the, the French Revolution, where in the French Revolution, they tried to rewrite the calendar. They did away with the calendar that everyone goes by and they tried to totally rewrite history with a new calendar. They tried to... they. they not, didn't just try to, they tear down monuments. They rewrote history to fit their narrative, to destroy any semblance of, of facts or history that could counter, that could disprove 
the the narrative that they were pushing because that narrative enabled their hidden criminal agenda. So that's the first one. The second one is a system of rewards and punishments, a system of rewards and punishments. Now, this kind of goes into a, a little bit. All these things in some ways fall underneath the complete control. And so they they create this, this system where they alone are good, as I said, and everyone else is evil. And so then the members, they are rewarded for adhering more to the ideology and they're rewarded by the group for creating and for, for committing crimes and actions against those outside of the group, right? In, in these groups, they have a, they need total belief, total belief in the ideology is the prerequisite for redemption. Total belief, total belief is needed for for redemption and all these groups in some way or shape or form, they're promising redemption and they're promising this utopian society. So what they, what they say is, if you don't feel like you've reached total redemption, if you don't feel like you've reached utopia, if you don't, if you have any questions in your mind, well, that's because here's the closed loop of logic. If you have questions in your mind, well, that's because you're still oppressed. And you don't know it and you haven't been redeemed yet. So what you have to do is fully believe our narrative that you're questioning. If you fully believe it, then you will come to a place of redemption. But if you ever question that redemption, it means that you haven't been redeemed. And so it's this cyclical argument that keeps people trapped. Manipulation. In this rewards and punishment, they, they manipulate their members. They do it by, by preying on their existing decency, their existing beliefs of, of justice, love, peace, freedom. But then they turn it into criminal action. They often use sleep deprivation. They use isolation, right? The big idea in this is they destabilize the, the person's identity then they consolidate it into a new identity and then they put the, their their new submissive identity into a rigid bound new network all so that these regimes of totalitarianism can have total control by using threats of isolation of of being beaten of being humiliated of getting your livelihood taken away of being shamed and name called. So they have these threats. But if you come in, if you obey, if you submit, if you become woke enough, then we'll give you conditional approval. And in the in the manipulation, they 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 use chanting, they use sleep deprivation, they use um, long hours of of work long hours of, of meetings, long hours of physical exertion to inhibit the person's ability to think clearly because thinking, not even thinking critically, but just thinking alone is the greatest danger to these groups. Number four, creating a sense of powerlessness. Creating a sense of powerlessness. And again, they do this through manipulation. They do this through cutting off the people from any existing relationships and groups. They do it through shame. Uh, Hannah Ardent, who was a German Jewish refugee, she wrote that she found, she, she studied these totalitarian groups and, and socialistic and Marxist and communist uh, regimes over the years. And she found that Hitler and Stalin destroyed public life and private life. And the, the regimes were based, the, based themselves in loneliness, on the experience of not belonging to the world at all, which is the most radical and desperate experience of man. It's a quote from her. Loneliness. They base the regimes on loneliness and not belonging to the world at all, being a total outsider, being a victim. That's what they do. When we talk about creating a sense of powerlessness, it's creating a sense of victimhood. 
You are a victim. You are oppressed. The system is working against you. All these people are corrupt and evil and they're, they're oppressing you and you, ju- you don't even know it. And you're coming to, you're awakening to the, the how you are so oppressed. And because of that, you're going to rise up with the working class for a new utopia that will free mankind. They'll have create justice and equality for all. But it's not true. They're, they're, they make people feel powerless like victims in it. And anytime, right, with this, with this powerlessness, how do they reinforce it? Anytime someone tries to stand up and question, they get crushed with fear. They are kicked out of the group. They are, they are canceled. They are um, beaten. They are doxxed. They have their jobs taken away from them. The mob comes after them to create this sense of powerlessness. Um, these totalitarian groups hate the family unit. They despise the family unit. They despise two parents with kids. That is the most dangerous thing because if you have two parents in a household and a family that's healthy, they can stand independently and they do not want people to be independent. They want people to be subversive to the group. So the first thing that they do is they try to destroy the family unit. They try to break up the traditional family unit of mom, dad, and kids. And what do they want to do? They want to make it all like a village. We're we're all brothers and sisters. We're all going to take care of our own kids like a village. We're not going to have one mom and one dad. That's the patriarchal system of white man privilege. We're going to do away with that and destroy that. In a lot of these cults, they, they control who you can have relationships with. And they set people up in these quote-unquote friendships of, of sexual relationships and everyone shares everyone. Why would they do that? Why do they do that? They do that so they can have control. They do that so no one can trust someone else. They do that so that there's no independence. They do that so you can't have strong relational bonds, so that you're always in a constant state of fear, so you're subversive to the group because the group wants to control you. If you see an organization that is working to destroy the family unit, you can be sure, you can be sure that there are elements of totalitarian ideologies taking place and they have a nefarious agenda. And we need to guard against that. You can see that in North Korea. You, you saw it in the slave trade in America. They would systematically make sure that the mom and the dad would be separated, that the kids would be separated from the parents. Why would they do this? Why would they do this? So that there wasn't a sense of independence. There wasn't a sense of family, of belonging, of knowing where you fit in to continually sow fear into the people. But we see this happening again across the world today, where there is a narrative going out where they're saying, we don't, we don't need the traditional family. That's broken. That's from a place of privilege. That, that is just the, you know, cis male gender, whatever, trying to control people. No, That is the place of health and wholeness and independence for individuals to protect themselves against corrupt and evil totalitarian ideologies that would seek to destroy and control people's lives for their own political power um, or whatever gain. Okay, number, number five or number four, fear and dependency. Fear and dependency. What they do in these in these groups, and, and we see this with the Stockholm syndrome, with how pimps control their prostitutes, how in, in human trafficking, how they control the the prostitutes underneath them. They create this high level of toxic fear, and they do that through through beating, through sleep dep- deprivation, as I said before, through creating anxiety within the individual by cutting the individual off by saying all these other people they don't love you they're out to get you they want to they want to hurt you if if the police catch you 
you're going to be in so much trouble. They're evil. They're not safe, but I'm the safe place. So they, they set it up so that the person in control is the only safe haven. And after you just do away with the family, then it's true. You don't have a safe haven any, anymore. You've cut your family off. You can't go to them because you've subscribed to the ideology that your family is corrupt and their ideas are corrupt and they're just so blind that they don't know it. So you have to stay away from those corrupt ideas. So you go to the totalitarian group cult and they say the outside world's bad, but we're good. We're the safe place. So you're like, oh, I'm a safe place. Okay, I'm going to go to my safe haven. But then that safe haven turns on you, belittles you, berates you, humiliates you, and punishes you if you ever get one hair out of line or even for no reason, right? Because in totalitarian states, they want irrational fear and they control people through irrational fear. But then once they create this irrational fear, that person wants to fight something and run to something, run to safety and fight against evil. But they've been programmed in their mind to think, okay, well, the outside world is evil. So I got to fight against my family and I got to fight against myself and these ideas because it's these ideas in here, my questioning in here, my thinking in here that got me in trouble. So I got to fight against myself. And then where am I going to run? Well, I'm going to run to my group, but it's my group is the very thing that is attacking me. So it puts these people in constant anxiety. And you, you can see this in, in North Korea as well. You see this where they have groups of people where everyone's watching each other and there's people then watching the group and everyone's turning each other in and reporting on each other. So there's all this secrecy that's going around. So the way that groups do this, and they do this to people inside their group and outside the group, because they want to make sure that people outside the group fear them. They want to make sure that people outside of their group get nowhere near. They don't touch it. They don't mess with the group. Why? Because if someone outside the group realized, wait a minute, I can actually speak truth into this totalitarian cult, if a person realizes this, then the cult's over because then people can think. They want to make sure and sow so much fear that no one would possibly stand up and say what they think against the group. So what do they do? They use tactics like humiliation. They use secrecy, quote unquote, justice and punishment. Sorry, it's the secrecy of reporting against everyone. And and then there's this these justice that takes place with inside the group of these rewards and punishments. And then there's severe punishments and humiliations with inside the group to perpetuate this. Then outside the group and inside the group, they use intimidation. The whole mob attacks the person or the individual that says, thinks, or even looks the wrong way. There's doxing, which is where they, they find the person's personal information and they put it out there and they just slander the person. There's cancel culture where people are losing their jobs. They're shutting down their, their ability to speak, freedom of speech. Cancel culture is all is, is a tactic used by totalitarian ideologies and groups, creating false and inflammatory statements. And you see this, someone... Someone says something against these groups or within the groups, and they just create just these groups create this world of toxic lies that could or could not be true. It doesn't matter, but they're just gonna just going to drag this person through the mud. They're gonna make this person lose their job because of the amount of pressure that they put on the company. And these things are happening today. They're happening today across the world, and they've happened in the past. Malicious pros prosecution where they pose as the victim. And we see this. We've seen this where people refuse to make a cake. And because of that, they have a malicious prosecution. They, there's litigation and they sue people where it's the group because they don't like someone speaking truth. They pose as this victim. They, they use blackmail. They use extortion. They use physical violence. They use physical isolation. 
But now remember, within the group, within the, the adherents of the group, this is all okay. Why? Because in Marxist totalitarian ideologies, postmodern ideologies, the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. What does that mean? It means if you have a goal at the end of everything, you can do whatever you need to get there. Besides, they are the evil people. We are the people with moral high ground. We are fighting for good so we can do any sort of violence. And that violence is not violence, but it's totally justified. It's totally justified. Another thing that these groups do, and, and I've mentioned this, is that for those outside the groups in order to silence them, and not only silence them, but get them to join their group, they begin to play with words. And this is what postmodernism does. They play with words. So they all of a sudden start saying things like, your words are violence. So now if I have a if I say something against a certain group, I have committed an act of violence against them. I've committed an act of violence because I said something. My words are violence. Then they say, so I'm like, okay, well, I'll be quiet then. I'm just not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna like, okay, you do you, whatever, right? Once we've bowed our knee, once we've bowed our knee to their intimidation and to their their corrupting of true justice and morality. They say, well, your words are violence. Okay, well, I'm going to be silent. I'm just not going to say anything. And then they say, well, your silence is violence. Your silence is com being complicit. Well, being complicit in what? I don't, I, I don't agree with your thesis. Oh, well, see, that's violence because you're disagreeing with me. So that's violence. I'm now hurt. I'm now offended. I'm now, I'm now so oppressed. I'm a victim. And you are a hateful, evil person. So my silence is violence. My words are violence. So the only thing that I can do is join their ideology. Once we bow our knee to totalitarian ideologies wherever they exist, it is all or nothing. It's either you are outside and an enemy or you are drinking the Kool-Aid. So now here's, here's the flip where, where they have this, this justification, their, this moral justification. They then say, our violence, we then say our, our looting, our rioting, our violence, our killing, that's not violence at all. That's fighting for justice. That's not violence. That's just expressing our, our anger from, from years of oppression from the proletariat or from the rich or from the wealthy or from the patriarchy or from the matriarchy, from whatever power system the identity politics want to be wants to be cut in today they say well this isn't violence this is justified this is actually good burning down these buildings is good because we are pressing for change and revolution and now you might say okay yeah well, maybe we do need a revolution. Maybe we do need systems to change. Okay, I could, I could see there's a validity to, okay, maybe we do need some reform. But then I would, I would then look and say, wait a minute. Well, what reform are we really pushing for? We're not actually pushing for reform or something healthy. We're undermining morality by saying that real violence is no longer violence. And at the same time, we're undermining the family unit where, where, no, where people no longer have freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And if you look underneath it all, where is the, where is the movement going? Not what they say on the outside, but really what's happening on the inside. Where is it all going? It is going for complete and utter control of the individual, destroying the individual altogether. And so I would then say, Okay, maybe we do need reform, but we definitely do not need a totalitarian ideology because we know from history where totalitarian ideologies live. Okay, number four, or number five. Here we are, reforming the followers' behaviors and attitudes. They want to see radical changes to a person's personality and behavior. They do this again by taking people away from their existing relational groups, by reforming them through re-education. 
by chanting, by exhausting them physically, by, by causing their, their cortisol levels to jump through the roof, adrenal fatigue, fear, intimidation. And then, as I mentioned before, as I've been talking about, they say we are the ones with superior human knowledge. We are the woke ones. And we alone oppose all the negative adversarial impurity and absolute evil in the world. We alone. And if you do not fight with us, then you're against us. If you do not do all these acts, which are criminal, oftentimes, criminal, if you do not behave in this certain way and fight evil, then you are evil. But we are good, and we are the only ones who have good, and you can't listen to anything outside of that. They drastically reform the person's attitudes and behaviors. Last one, number six. It's all within a closed system of logic. And we've touched on this as we went through, how it's all on a, a closed system of logic, which means that it's a cyclical argument. So they justify evil by condemning righteousness, seeing that we're the only ones that are, are good, that, as I said, you're violent if you merely question their narrative. Well, that's violence. And therefore, they are justified using actual violence to fight against people who question it. And they do it through stealing. They justify, well, if you're not part of this group, you're evil. And therefore, stealing and killing and beating and cheating and abusing and shaming, humiliating, violence is all justified to fight the oppression that is coming against us. We're, we're totally absolved from any guilt because of the group that we are a part of. These closed logic systems where they do not let any empirical data in. I've been in conversations recently where I'll, I'll bring up empirical data, I'll, a, a, a wealth of empirical data from some of the most liberal sources. And what will people say? Oh, and I've heard, I've heard, well, that data is racist. Well, those, you can't trust its statistics. They can just be manipulated. There's no actual looking at the data. There's no actual, you know, thought about, hmm, yeah, this data might be onto something. There's no actually looking at the facts. It's just the narrative. It's just preserving the narrative, and they do it through discrediting the person. I've heard someone say to me, oh, well, it seems like this person believes in, in, in this sort of ideology, so I'm not even going to look at the data that that person wrote. I'm not even going to look at the facts because of the person that it came from. I'm not even going to look at the facts, which didn't come from that person, which came from other studies. Right, They cannot let any factual evidence in to their system of ideology because the moment that they do, it all falls apart. Because in postmodernism, there is no truth. In postmodernism, there is – it's all a social construct, which is, is, is quite hilarious because in, you know, in, this, in this gender war that we're in, you know, it's like, well, you can have an infinite amount of genders, but gender is just a social construct anyways, so it's not even real. Again, a cyclical argument. That's socially constructed things aren't even real, so it doesn't even matter. So then which one is it? Are there an infinite amount of genders or are genders just a social construct? No, there's two genders. There's male and female. End of story. Okay, moving on. Postmodern Marxism justifies justifies anything that they do with their end goal. And we saw this with the, the killing fields in Cambodia. We saw this with the gulags in Russia. We, we see this in North Korea today. They want a monopoly of information, right? Anything from the outside is absolutely evil. Oftentimes, you'll find that people who are, are adherents to totalitarian groups 
you will find it nearly impossible to have a rational conversation with them. They will find it impossible to have a conversation with someone that exists outside of the group. Why? Because anyone that challenges their reality, their false reality, is themselves evil and corrupt. And any sort of thinking, any sort of listening, any sort of considering a fact undermines their need for redemption and their path of redemption. The mere questioning of the reality undermines their process of redemption. Because remember, a person finds redemption in these totalitarian ideologies by completely believing the narrative. By completely believing the narrative. And you can't have one step outside of those narratives. I did an interview a couple of years back in this interview, in the pre-interview before we went on air, we were agreeing on a, a lot of issues when it came to, to pornography and sex trafficking. Agreeing on a lot of issues. At the end of the interview as on air, I, I, I thought we were in total agreement on this. I didn't think it would be any controversy. So I, I brought it back up about how pornography uh, destroys both girls and boys across the world. And all of a sudden, on air, she starts backpedaling. And I was kind of confused. I'm like, what's going on here? After the interview, she's like, yeah, you totally need to take all that part out. I don't want my name attached to that. Um, and it was clear that she was afraid of what other people in her group would have thought. Because all of a sudden, she actually had, and before the interview, she had a belief that at least privately, she was willing to admit to which was contrary to the talking points of her group. But she didn't want her name to be on it because she would have then fallen out of her path to redemption and be canceled and shamed and humiliated and blacklisted by her social justice warrior group. Another thing that these groups do, as I mentioned, they have two narratives. They have the narrative to the outside world and the narrative of the inside world. So in, in North Korea, for instance, when I was there, you, you would hear these narratives and you'd see them on, on billboards and posters and their propaganda everywhere saying North Korea is the most prosperous nation on the face of the earth. Now, you know, these people, they don't have any access to internet, so they have no idea what the outside world is really like because it's a complete totalitarian state where every piece of information is controlled. But it doesn't, it's not hard to look around and be like, wait a minute, we're not a prosperous, rich nation. Everyone is starving, living in abject poverty. There is zero cars, one gas station, two gas stations in the entire country, maybe. Maybe there's more, but you know, when we were on the roads, we'd be on these four lane highways and we'd drive for two hours without seeing another car. Two hours on these highways, main highways, without seeing another car. Absolute abject poverty. But the narrative is we are a prosperous nation. The narrative in North Korea, the narrative in North Korea is that children are king. Be it children are, are abused. Children are starving. Children are sitting on the side of the road with absolutely nothing. And so they have to walk with these, these conflicting narratives, these conflicting narratives which cause confusion. But in these groups, Remember, they want to isolate people. They want to isolate people from the outside world. North Korea, they isolates the entire nation from the outside world. They want to isolate people from their family. They break up the family unit. Everyone is watching on everyone. Their you know, kids turn in their parents because they get a reward and they don't want to get punished. So they so distrust. So you, you can't trust the outside world. You can't trust your family. And then... You can't trust your own thoughts. And so you can't even question, wait a minute, there's this contradiction. I'm living in this vast contradiction in the world. They say that I, we are living in a prosperous nation, but everyone's starving. But you can't even question your thoughts. You have to isolate yourself from your own rational thinking because if you think you are dangerous and you lose redemption and there will be severe severe consequences. And what happens when you do start to think 
Should you voice your concerns, as we see North Korea and many other organizations across the world, there's a network of people who will turn you in for re-education. In the USSR, it was that you were sent to gulags, re-education camps, or hopefully they could redeem you. But at the end of the day, they found out that because you were from whatever class or gender or sex or or ideology, background, race, the color of your skin, you have an incurable virus. You have an incurable virus if you cannot be, quote unquote, re-educated and comply and subvert yourself to the totalitarian group. So what happens then? Well, in places like North Korea or the USSR, You'll go to a concentration camp, to a gulag, to a re-education camp, forced to hard labor for decades, and then at some point, you'll have a, you'll you'll face the firing squad when when you're done away with, when the state no longer needs you as a cog in their wheel. In organizations that don't have that much power yet, whether it's a small cult or whether it's a a large political movement, you get excommunicated from the movement. You get excommunicated from the movement. You get blocked. You get shamed. You get humiliated. You get your, they try to strip your job away from you. They strip your livelihood away from you. They sue you. They destroy your life. Why? Because they want to make sure that no one else in this organization, inside or outside, would ever dare encroach or infringe on this totalitarian wickedness would ever dare stand up to them. Otherwise, they get crushed by the hammer of socialist Marxism and totalitarian ideologies. So in closing, we need to be aware. As I started this with the quote from Solomon Ash in 1952, the, man, uh, the greater man's ignorance to these ideas and principles of his social surroundings, the greater our ignorance, the more susceptible we will be to them. Why? Because remember, they, they prey on your desire for peace and your desire for justice and your desire for utopia and a desire for equality. They prey on that. They use words like that of love. We all are one big family as they destroy real families. They prey on that so that you bend your knee. They just need you to bend your knee and you give them one inch and that you can't, you can't take anything back. You apologize and then they, they humiliate you for apologizing until you quit your own job and destroy your own life. And then they, you can never get redemption from these totalitarian ideologies, from these totalitarian groups. Ash goes on to say, but the greater his knowledge or your knowledge is in the operations and the consequences of, right? It's not just, okay, I know how an, uh, a totalitarian ideology works. Okay, I know how it works. It's not just that, but we have to know what are the consequences of this. Otherwise, it's like, well, you know, they can do them and I'm going to do me, but no, it is never enough. We need to know the consequences. What happens when someone is coming out of one of these uh, totalitarian groups? It is years of post-traumatic trauma and and stress, and anxiety, and insomnia, years. But the more knowledge that we have of their operations and the consequences of them, the more free you and I can be in regards to them. And that is who we are called to be. That is who we were born to be. People were born to be free, and we're free by knowing the truth. And by knowing the truth, and by walking in the truth and walking in freedom and walking in our purpose to be people who stand for, for truth, for real righteousness, for real justice, not social justice, but real justice. We can be beacons of light for other people around us. We can be beacons of light for our friends, for our family, for our community, but it will probably cost you something. It will probably cost you something if you're, if you're standing up against totalitarian ideologies. It's going to cost you something. But that is who we are, are called to be as humans. 
to stand up for truth and to not bow our knee to fear and intimidation. That is all for this episode. Please, my book, Anchor the Discipline to Stop Drifting. I sometimes wish it was about this topic, but it's not. It's about you taking a responsibility and action as an individual to press forward through mundane seasons, to focus your life and not be overwhelmed trying to improve everything at one time, but realizing, wait, if I take small steps every day, if I lay bricks rather than trying to, you know, get a pre-built mansion, if I lay bricks diligently with, with humility and patience, step by step, we can actually anchor ourselves and reach our goals. So please, my book, Anchor the Discipline to Stop Drifting, it is out. I highly recommend it. A short 100-page read, highly actionable. If you're feeling stuck or you're feeling like you're drifting through life, this book is definitely the book for you. Finally, I love getting your questions. Please WhatsApp me at plus one two zero two nine two two zero two two zero about this episode or any other episodes. WhatsApp me and I will answer your questions right here on the show. And in closing, you are a change maker. You are a person that was born to go out and, and uncover your purpose and to know and find truth and to live and walk in that truth. So I hope this week you go out and you stand up for truth and you own your future.